Super has got many names, sometimes they call it Dagoba. Dagoba is in Sri Lanka. But you know the British cannot pronounce Dagoba, so they say Pagoda. <laughs> so Pagoda has been used for uh, the structures that was built in Japan, in Korea, and in China. And sometimes they call it Chantia also. Chantia. You know, Chantia, we use the word Chantia. Now, what is a being of stupa? Stupa comes from the Sanskrit word for stoop, means a heap. You see, so in the past, and the way they honor great kings is to build a heap above the bones because they do the cremation and they build a heap, you know. And uh, so uh, the radix is called sarira. sarira. So after cremation, they put a heap above the, uh, the, the relics. And you can see that the uh, stupa architecture developed from these are pre Buddhist mounds. You know? and built over the great kings and uh, religious teachers in India. Now, this was the advice that the Buddha gave to Ananda the last three months before the Buddha passed away. Ananda asked the Buddha, how does he want his body to be uh, you know, treated? He says that build, uh, his body should be cremated, and after that, the relics, they should build a, a stupa over there, because the stupa will, uh, brings inspiration for pilgrims. So, uh, so the, the, this is how universal monarchs have been honored, stupas have been built over their remains. And when the Buddha passed away, his body was cremated, and after the body was cremated, relics appeared, right? Remnants, rem rem because sometimes when the bodies get burned, they're all being charred up, they're pieces of bone, but in the case of the Buddha, they're relics for it. And, uh, Kings and many communities came to Kapilavastu, hoping to get hold of the relics. And so you have that, like, uh, from King of Agada, Ajatasattu, the Lachilis, the Sakis, the Buddhas are from the Sakis community, the Buddhists. Kolias is from his mother's side. Uh, there was also some Brahmins. Also, the place where the Buddha passed away, Kushinara, that area, that community is called Malas. Right. So everybody wants the relic, and they wanted to fight with one another to get the relics. So it is a good thing that there was a Brahmin by the name of Drona. Brahmin said, no, 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 we should not fight over the relics. So what he did was that the Buddha's relics would be put into eight portions, eight different parts. And each of these parts are given to different communities. So one portion, one eighth of the relics was given to King Ajatasattu, that he is the king of the uh, son of King Vibhisara. From Magadha and uh, Lachavis from Veshali, uh, Sakis who came from Kapilavastu, the Buddhists from Alakappa, Kolias from Ramagrama, uh, then there's a Brahmin uh, uh, Veda Deepa, the Malas, there are two groups of Malas, one is from Pava and another one is from Kashinara. So he divided that into eight parts and then for himself, uh, Brahmin uh, Dona, he took the ashes as well as the pot that was being used to distribute the, uh, the relics. So now, each of these portions of the relics, they built a stupa over. So how many stupas are there? Uh, there are eight stupas. I do not know whether uh, a Brahmin donor built another stupa, I do not know, but there are eight stupas. Then what happened? And uh, about 200 years later, King Ashoka came along and, you know, he became a Buddhist. And uh, he had so much reverence from the Buddha, that he wanted to build stupas throughout his empire. Uh, the expression is 80,000, 84,000 stupas. 84,000 is a lot, a lot of stupas. So he built a lot of stupas. So what does he put inside the stupas? He has to put the Buddha relics, right? So he went and took the relics from the seven of the stupas, opened up the stupa, left a little bit of the Buddha relics inside, and the rest he took up in order to implant in each of the stupas that he has built. Okay? Uh, there is one stupa that was left remaining. Uh, this was under the Kolia, that is the Buddha, the King Mahamaya's uh, clan. Uh, this was not touched by Ashoka because apparently it was being protected by the Nangas. And if this uh, Kolia was not under the Emperor Ashoka, so they asked him, please, please don't open up this uh, stupa. Let us remain. So if you were to go to India now at Rama Gama, one eighth of the Buddha's writings are believed to be inside this, this uh, Rama Gama Stupa. And uh, 
according to accounts of Saint John, such as elephants or clown with a lotus flower and sprinkle water over the stupa and all that. So, and some that light coming out from the stupa. So next time when you go for picnic, you see where not you can see some lights coming from the stupa. But one eighth of the wood's relics are believed to be inside the stupa at Ramagrama. That's close to the beginning. Uh, uh, yeah, is that uh, all right? So. So uh, this is a stupa built during Ashoka's uh, time. It's called Sanchi. It's a beautiful stupa. One of the beautiful remaining stupa. So many others have gone. So these are some ancient stupas. This is one in Sri Lanka, which they call Tupa or Dagoba, Chinese pagodas, and the Tibetan Chota. They all mean stupa. That means the same thing. And the types of stupa, there are four major types of stupa. One is called the Sari Rika stupa or the relics to go like this one. We have the picture because we have the relic of the Buddha inside. It was presented to us on Anuradha Pura. So the Buddha's relics is inside. So as you approach the stupa, it is as if you're approaching, you're coming to the presence of the Buddha inside. So this is a Sanarika Sutra. Okay. It contains the relics of the Buddha, or sometimes even the relics of the disciples. We have also the relics of some, some uh, uh, Aryan, Monks and nuns inside. Uh, all right. So, uh, this so this is called a Sarvarika Supa, relic Supa, that we do the veneration. The second type of Supa is called an object Supa. Uh, this contains objects used by the Buddha. For instance, the arms hold of the Buddha, the robes, and the water pot. And this uh, Supa that you see in the picture is, is at Kesariya in Bihar. And it is based on the Supa that Borobodo was constructed. So, Borobodo follows the here. So those that have gone on the Buddhist will remember the stupa that we went to. The third stupa is called a memorial stupa. This is to mark the events of the Buddha's life. For instance, the Kesha Raya stupa is a place where the Buddha offered his arms bowl to the lady Chavis. And then the fourth stupa is called a Bodhi stupa. These are the small stupa built by the Bodhis. They don't contain any relics at all. It is just an offering of memories. Let me just mention a little bit of this uh, Kesariya Supa, which is a memorial Supa. So this was like three months before the Buddha passed away. He announced that he, wanted, he was about to pass away in three months' time uh, in, in the, the city of Ishali. And at that time, when the news started spreading that Buddha was passed away, everybody flocked to listen to him, right? But you know, the teacher that you respect so much is about to pass away. So the last time to see him, everybody came and flocked to see him. So he came to this place, Kesaria. This is also where he taught the Kalama Sutta, very close to here. The Lichavis, the people of Lichavis, followed the Buddha. And the Buddha was walking with the monks. And they keep following him. And he says, you all go back. Don't need to follow me. And they started, okay, they say they go back. But the moment the Buddha walked, they started following the Buddha again. So what did the Buddha do? He created a vision of a big shazam that was a big, like cliff, like that. So, the Lichavis was on one side and the Buddha was on the other side. So they could not cross the chasm to reach the Buddha. And the Buddha also offered them the arms bowl. So this was the place where the Buddha offered the arms bowl. And the arms bowl actually went to many places. I do not know where the arms bowl is. It could be in Afghanistan. Yeah. So this is the Kesharya Supra. To mark the place where the Buddha offers the arms bowl. And when the Buddha told the Lichavis, go home, go home. And then, in order to prevent them from following, we created a chasm, you know, so that they could not cross like a big valley like that. All right. And uh, we use the words circumambulation, okay? That means we walk around a religious object. Okay? Uh, circum is to go around, ambulate means to walk around. And uh, large stupas will sometimes have walkaways for circumambulation. Uh, uh, like here, we, it's not, it, our place is not so large. So you can actually walk around the stupa. Let me just tell you the story about why. And when you go for circumambulation, your right shoulder might be towards the object of veneration. So you always walk in a kind of a clockwise direction. Not the other way. Uh, you must walk with your right arm towards the object of veneration. Uh, let me just tell you a story. Uh, this is a story about how uh, there was a stupa. And uh, you know, in India sometimes uh, you have cows everywhere, sometimes you've got cow dung. So sometimes cow dung, what likes, likes the cow dung very much? There was one beetle who loves the cow dung. Maybe the cow dung was a bit fresh and he enjoyed the, the, the cow dung. And 
after what the column is dry, so the beetle was inside the column. So what happens? Uh, there was a huge storm and rain. So the whole uh, super area was flooded. And the uh, beetle was hanging onto the column. And because the water was swirling around, the water carried the column around the stupa. And after the Kaudan started going around the stupa, the beetle died. And you know where the beetle was reborn? Guess. Do you like to guess where he was born? The beetle? To be born in another Kaudan? No. He was reborn in the heavens. The beetle was born in the heavens? Because the beetle has gone round the stupa. Ah, so you can see the significance of going round. It's a kind of emulation. <laughs> the beetle can be born in the heavens. Uh, this is just one of the stories. Uh, it's quite interesting. Okay. Now, as far as the architecture of the stupa is concerned, there are many shapes. And uh, this one comes from the Sanskrit treatise on the architecture of the stupa. Stupa could look like a lotus flower. I don't see how it looks like. How to make a, lo a stupa in a lotus flower form. Or amalaka fruit. So it could look like a fruit. It could look like a heap of rice. It could look like a rounded pot that you turn upside down. It could look like a bubble or a bell. Okay. So the most common stupa in Sri Lanka is either in the shape of a bell or a bubble. And this picture that you see here is uh, Tuparama. Uh, we have just gone to Sri Lanka. And this contains the collarbone of the Buddha. The very first super built in Sri Lanka, the Purama. Uh, but did you say the robot that after taking a coconut water, we went to the super? <laughs> the ground was so hot, we got to walk back into Sri Lanka. Okay, now in terms of BGF super here, uh, when coming up with this super, we actually designed the super based on uh, some supers that were very inspiring. We were very inspired by the by the Japanese super, the Peace Pagoda. And uh, right on top is a crystal. It's a natural crystal uh, that has been cut uh, in facet form, and this represents the really bond of the highest achievement. Right at the top. Can you see the crystal of that? It's a natural crystal. It's not something that is done in the lab. And then you have the parasol. This parasol is on black umbrella. The seven days. A parasol represents a royalty, so the Buddha will come from Rodna, so they represent royalty. But there are seven parasols. This represents the seven factors of enlightenment. You can count the seven. If you count from eight or six, you better let me know. <laughs> <laughs> because we made seven. <laughs> so this will protect the relic chamber. And uh, after that, you have the square platform of that, and that represents the vulnerable truth. Jatari, uh, Arya Sachami. Yeah. And then you have the dome shape. Uh, this is called the receptacle of relics. This is called Dhatu Gapa, the dome shape. And then you have uh, three, uh, uh, this uh, Zilla Samadhi, three, three steps. And then of course you have the square base, uh, which faces the four directions. Okay. So this is the design for uh, the uh, the Saririka Stupa in Etnitria. We didn't want the Stupa to be too elaborate because like, sometimes you go to some Asian countries and make it too elaborate in one. You want it to be simple, very beautiful and elegant. And this was especially made for us. What are the items in this Stupa so that you might understand? You have the relics of the Buddha as I mentioned. Uh, you have got some relics of monks and nuns to represent both the uh, Biko and Bikuni are balance, uh, not just uh, not just Bikus, but also Bikunis as well. And we have one relic from our late chief reverend, Keshri Gamananda, who we are very closely connected. Yeah. So the relics are here. And besides that, there is also a fragment of a rope from Jinko Kenshi Rebojin, is a Bhutanese monk. And we have put the uh, inscriptions uh, of the sutras, Written on bronze plate, you got the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta, the first sutra taught by the Buddha, Anatta Lakana Sutta, which were taught to the five months, and after hearing the Anatta Lakana Sutta, all the months became Arahans. Uh, we have the Mahasatipatana Sutta, it's a discourse on meditation. We've got the seven parts of the Abhidharma in brief. We also have the Heart Sutra, uh, which is uh, pretty much uh, 
very much treasured by the Mahayana tradition. And Anika Jati Samsara, this was the uh, utterance of the Buddha when he gained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. Yeah. And besides that, we also have the leaf and bark from the Bodhi tree, taken from Anuradha Pura. I mentioned to you about how uh, Sangamita brought the tree from India into Sri Lanka. So we managed to get the bark as well as the leaf. Now we've got the tree also. And uh, Buddha statue was placed under the Bodhi tree itself. And also there are offerings from other devotees. So some offerings, they are all placed inside the stupa. So this stupa contains many precious things. What are the benefits of stupa? Well, uh, when you build a stupa, you build very positive karmic imprints in the mind. And so those of us who are connected in the stupa, we build a lot of positive imprints. Those who have participated in this. And this action could result in fortunate births. You can actually be born in a rich family in next birth. Or you have a beautiful body and beautiful voice. So uh, you got good looking, nice voice, attractive. You bring joy to people when they see you, they feel very joyful. And, and you have a long and happy life where your wishes are quickly fulfilled. Uh, so those are associated with the super how wonderful. Okay? And also able to reach enlightenment quickly. Then some people destroy supas in the past and they destroy they destroy the super is extremely negative uh, because it's like killing a saint saint you think. It's like killing a saint when you destroy a stupa. It creates a very massive negative karma that leads to serious future problems. The mind is always in a state of paranoia. Paranoia means that you always feel that you're going to be attacked, people don't like you, and you feel as if you're in a box and you know. And uh, also when the uh, rebirth comes, they are reborn in unfortunate things, uh, suffering things. So this is a repercussion of destroying a stupa. Okay, now I will tell you the story about the monk with the golden voice. You want to hear a story? Yeah. So there was this monastery uh, out in the mountains. The people will go in the morning and evening. Why? Because they want to hear the chanting. And the chanting in this temple, actually the chanting of one voice, is so beautiful that sometimes when people hear the chanting, they get so inspired, and sometimes even tears might roll down from their cheeks, just hearing the chanting, beautiful, beautiful voice, golden voice, beautiful chanting. So uh, every time people would travel, even long distances, just to be in this temple, just to listen to the chanting. And of course, in these temples, you've got beautiful bells that will ring, wind bells that will ring. So you hear the wind bells and you hear the chanting. But the amazing thing is that, despite coming to this temple, hearing this beautiful chant uh, by this monk who is chanting, nobody has seen the monk who does the chanting. You know why? Any reason? Can you think why? You can hear the voice of the monk, but you don't see the monk himself. What happened? Any, 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 uh, anything, any, any reason you think would be the reason? Why, why? Why do you think that uh, people have not seen the monk? you like to suggest? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So, recorded voice. <laughs> no, that time they don't have recorded, okay. <laughs> okay, that could be one, but the monk exists. Okay, the monk exists. Any, any reason? you like to give a reason why? People come to the temple and hear the chanting, but they have not seen the monk. Why? Any reason? You like to give a reason? Or you? You like to give a reason? Guess, just guess, it's okay. Okay, the reason, uh, people are very curious. Oh, they think that the voice is so beautiful. How do you think the monk looks like? It's tall, right? Must be very good looking, right? Beautiful voice, must be very good looking. So one of the devotees go and ask the chief, can we see the monk of who, who has this beautiful golden voice? We want to see him. No, they don't allow. So this, uh, this devotee keep asking, asking. So the monk said, okay. Alright? So when they see the monk, what happens? Huh? 
The man was not tall, was not handsome, was not like a film star. No, no, no. The man was short, fat, out of shape, one leg longer than the other. So when he walked, it was like pottering around. And I said, oh my goodness. The voice of the man, of the man and the body looks completely different. You never expect that somebody with such a beautiful voice will look like this. So what happens? So now we have to go back to the story. Why was he born thick and red and short and not good looking ugly? And okay. So in one of his past life, that temple that he was where where he was was building a stupa. But this man used to criticize. He said, Ah, this stupa is look happy, la short, la out of shape, like he won't criticize the stupa. Until the stupa was finished. So he has a lot of negative things to say about the stupa. Then after that, he started realizing, I know, yeah, I should not say all those things. So what he did was that he started uh, bringing, stringing up bells, or silver bells, put in the temple. So every time the wind blows, the bells will ring and create a beautiful sound in the temple. So because he put the beautiful bells in the temple, he is got a beautiful voice. And because he criticized the stupa, I don't know what happened to him, how it looks like. Huh? So you may ask, what do you think of the Jeff stupa? What do you say? Second is 